I work at a place called Singularity University, and our focus is to help people understand exponential technologies, to be able to understand what an exponential is, to be able to understand what exponential technologies can do, to think about the implications, the strong disruption that they can cause, and then to be able to take those and apply them for themselves. Now, one of the things that I get asked, because I've been there since the beginning, I've been teaching there, I work with people coming in from fields of science and technology from all around the world, and I get asked, what is that one technology, that one science, that new breakthrough, which excites you the most? What is that sharpest part of the cutting edge, which thrills you, where you're saying, that's we're gonna, the next unicorn is coming here, the next game changer, the next world changer. What's the most important new thing that you're excited by? And I have an answer, and I'll tell you, none of them excite me. None of the new technologies excite me, because new technologies have problems. New technologies, in retrospect, they disappear sometimes. New technologies, the way they're implemented, are limited by the imagination of the original inventor. I would like to think about technologies in that version one of any new technology, its purpose, in most cases, is to inspire other people to do it well. What I'm excited by, what should excite you, all of you, are old technologies. Technologies which are 10 and 20 and 30 years old. And here's why. But first, when I say exponential technologies, let's talk about what an exponential technology is. Now, it's a mathematical term, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. They are surprising to us, and they're not intuitive to us. For example, ordinary steps. If you take 30 steps, I'll get from here over to there. If I take another 30 steps, I'll get into the hallway. That's the nature of, of linear counting, the way that we're used to it. On the other hand, if you start taking exponential steps, I start with one, then two, then four, then eight, and notice each step, I'm not only moving further than the step before, I'm moving further than the combination of all earlier steps before. If I were to take 30 exponential steps, be going a billion meters, 26 times around the Earth. If I were to take another 30 exponential steps, I'd be reaching a galaxy. But it's not just that there's the mathematics, we're saying exponential technologies. For example, computers are an exponential technology. What you can get for $1,000 in today's money. It's not just that they're, they're changing in some mathematical way. They become smaller, they become cheap cheaper, they become lighter, they become more powerful. I mean, computers, I'm sure you've seen pictures, they used to be giant. So for example, here's from the 1940s. How many computers do you see in this picture? So there's four, there's four computers in this picture. Because in the 1940s, computer was a job. A computer is somebody who does computing in the same way that a lawyer is somebody who does law, or a baker is somebody who does baking. But in the 1940s, then you see this inflection point the power of computers is moving along and all of a sudden it starts to skyrocket. They build digital computers, the first digital computer, and that first digital computer and the ones that followed made all the human computers obsolete. If you say human computer today, it, it almost doesn't make sense to us. But that first computer was only available to a few people in the military. Then they start building more. Within a few years you have 10 computers. But it's not just that there's 10 computers, those 10 computers are available to hundreds of people. They start getting more powerful, they get more available. In the 1950s, 1960s, IBM builds them, and if you're a corporation, you can have a computer, or at least lease it, and it's available to thousands and tens of thousands. Then they become cheap enough that universities have them, that undergraduates can use them. It keeps on going. We all have computers. They're available on our desktop, they're available in our, in our briefcases, in our purses, and now computers are available to the whole world in the cloud, in our cell phones. And that is one thing which is changing exponentially. Of course, there's a lot of different technologies. It's, it's, it's artificial intelligence, robotics, biotechnology, medicine. Now, what do these exponential technologies give us? They give us change, they give us disruption. For example, take the moonshot. Take the real moonshot. Going to the moon is difficult, and it, it has happened, but there's only been a few countries which have done it. The United States, Russia, Japan, China, the European Union, and India. We, going to the moon takes computers. Going to the computer takes a giant industry that, that only governments can do. Well, US, Japan, China, India, the rest, and my friend Bob. He's sending a robot to the moon next year. 
in the company Moon Express. Now that, that is moonshot thinking being done by individuals and it's not just going to the moon, it can be going to space. Right now computers are in our satellites, but right now satellites, we think of them as being $150 million things. What we do with them is limited to the companies who build them and you have to be a large company or a government to make it. But here's Planet Labs and they're building it instead of for $150 million, $150,000. They send them up, they only last two or three years at a time but that's good because the next batch that they send up has the next batch of technology in it. Now, you might be saying, all right, fine, they're sending those tiny little satellites up, but they're still using rocket technology to get there. But even that has exponential components. Here's my uh, colleague and uh, Global Grand Challenges expert, Darlene Dom. She also did a startup, do-it-yourself rockets, to help people design rockets which will launch the satellites, which at $150,000, are in the, in the domain not just of governments, but of universities, of individuals, of small groups to be able to do whatever they want with. So these technologies are giving us this really interesting path forward. But I don't want to avoid the problems that they might be coming up with, that when we look at the future of these technologies, we do get worried about them. For example, there is the topic of jobs. We worry about jobs. There's been a long conversation recently about the jobs could cause massive unemployment and not just for you know, white collar workers, but even all the way down to agriculture. Here, here is a robot which can plant seedlings, for example. And in the past few years, there's been the big dialogue about them. Books written by technologists and economists about what technological, exponential technologies could do. And in fact, a group of experts got together and saying, this is so important, we need to write to the president and tell him that these exponential technologies are very powerful and they might change so fast that we can't keep up with them and might cause inequality such that in the midst of abundance, we have permanent poverty. However, they said, these same changes can give us tools to fix them and we could instead have prosperity around the world. Now, they were worried about this and they wrote about this. It was 1964. This is not a new problem. And given that people have been talking about technological unemployment for a long time, is there a reason why we need to worry about this now? Perhaps, yes. And what makes it different? It's the unintuitive nature of exponential technologies, the speed of exponential technologies. And of course, you know, when we think about speed, we, you know, we, we've seen, say, for example, robots. And when we see them in the movies, they're amazing. And when we see them in real life, they're never as exciting. But that's the thing about exponential technologies. They can be very deceiving. You know, they come out, they look clunky. Here, DARPA had a contest for people inventing rescue robots, robots. But if you're a rescue robot, you're not supposed to be able to knock your own head off, but this one did. Here's robots, humanoid robots, which can go in and turn a valve and be able to pick up a drill and do something. And it went from being clunky to, well, that's interesting, and it works in 50 minutes, though. It can do in 50 minutes what you and I would be able to do in 15 seconds. But with exponential technologies, they move very, very quickly. Google's autonomous cars. Ten years ago, we would be surprised that they would be able to build autonomous car technology. But they've been moving along. Other car companies are doing that. And then it keeps on going. Tesla just this week announced that they are sending out as a software update autonomous capabilities to their Tesla cars. And of course you say, well, those cars cost $80,000. But remember, they think of their own cars as exponential technology. They're not building smart cars. They're building computers with wheels. And so that $80,000 car becomes 40, becomes 20. That's the nature of exponential technologies. Algorithms, we have algorithms like deep learning, what can you do with deep learning? Well, they taught it to recognize pictures of cats, or they taught it to picture, to picture numbers. And you say, well, that's really interesting, but cats and numbers, small children can recognize those. But very quickly, almost at the same time, they also taught deep learning to be able to recognize pictures of potentially cancerous cells, and to be able to do it as well as doctors could do. We have the Google car, and it's exponential, but you're saying, well, there's only a few of them, and there's 100 million cars sold each year. How could this be game-changing? But it can be. And this is really important. If you were designing the future of a city, if you're designing roads for 2030, and you didn't know about exponentials, you could be designing a system which is going to be obsolete before it's done. 
you have to take them into account. But of course, it's not just Google cars that you're changing, it's all of the technologies that you're changing. The good news is that we can do something about this. We can all work on them together. Now at Singularity University, we bring people together. And I know every program, somebody comes to me and says, Catherine, you're talking about 20 different technologies. I don't understand it. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I tell them, that's great. That's good. Because that feeling, you need it. That feeling, you're going to get used to it. Because it is the power of beginners coming together. Beginners asking questions about when they're told you can't solve something, they say, yes, we can. International and interdisciplinary and teams in a space where they feel safe asking questions and building new things that problems get solved. Let me give an example of what people are doing in this space where they're willing to ask questions about what can be solved. Andre Wegner is one of my colleagues. He teaches. He works on 3D printers. 3D printers are not new technology. They've been around for 30, over 35 years. But what he's saying now is that these old technologies have become more widespread, wide enough that they can be adopted, wide enough that they're changing the supply chain. So he's building tools to be able to prevent counterfeiting, to be able to give customers certainty about what they're building. Because counterfeits and supply chain failures cause death and destruction in the world. He understands the problem within that he builds a solution. He decides to fix it. We know that in the world, many people are faced with life without good roads. And without good roads, even if you have a cell phone to call your doctor, how does the medicine get back to you? Well, a team at Singularity University looking at that and saying, well, drones, they're not new technology, but what if we use them to be able to move high value goods? They started in 2011. Here's pictures from the test in Papua New Guinea where they're moving medical tests, TB samples, saliva samples, from villages to a clinic. If you're doing blood tests, right now you take the blood and you have to put it into a machine which has a centrifuge, which then has data capabilities and reads the information out. These machines can cost $50,000. One of the teams a couple of years ago was saying, well, $50,000, that means most people can't have it. Are there other ways to have a centrifuge? And they looked around and they said, wait, we all have centrifuges, usually sitting in our entertainment center, DVD players, CD players. So combining old technology with lab and a chip technology, they're building a way to have these devices which could cost $1,000 instead of $50,000. They saw a problem, they chose to fix it. And Neil Guedes, last year, was looking at the problem of substandard housing and expensive housing, and she was saying, 3D printing, again, it is not new, but what happens if you're combining 3D printer technology with new concrete technology, you could 3D print houses for a fraction of the cost than you can today. And she's working on the technology and on the law. She sees the problem, she chooses to fix it. Volunteering, that is not a new technology, but the ability to say, I want 100,000 volunteers to come and volunteer their time five seconds at a time, here's a company, be my eyes. If you want to volunteer for it, if a person who's visually disabled sends a picture, you can look at the picture and describe what are they looking at. You can volunteer, you can help somebody on the other side of the world for five seconds, for 10 seconds, and make a huge difference in their lives. Now, of course, you could say the Google technology, that is built by a large corporation. The Google technology, it's not new. It's just once you can fit a supercomputer inside of a car, you can do interesting things with it. You can, again, build technology so safe that they save lives. But that's a large company. But these technologies, they get smaller. They fit in more places. And this very year at Singularity University, this team was saying, what happens if we put the same sensors that are in the car into a helmet? A quarter of the 1.2 million deaths that happen each year in the world are on motorcycles. They're saying by putting it into a helmet, they will be able to save lives, be able to have motorcyclists know if a car is coming up too quickly to them. And they will be able to sell this helmet for $115, it's about 7,000 rupees. It's a reasonable price. They saw a problem and they decided to fix it. So this is why I'm excited about all these old technologies. We are moving away from the solutions that one or two people are coming up with, and we're moving towards the creativity of a 1,000 people, of a million people, or 10 million people. Submarine technology is not new, but when the technology is in the hands of individuals, in the hands of high schoolers, they can use it to track down pollution. Kids are having fun with them. 
we all then have the ability to become makers, to be able to take these and choose what we do with them. Even things like these AI technologies which we're worried about, Watson was interesting, but what happens when Watson is in our own devices and each of us has access to analysts in the same way that we all now have access to computing. We all need education and we all need to be lifelong learners, but with the connectivity that technologies are giving us, and this connectivity is around the world and it means that we are, for example, not even separated anymore by the barriers of language. Translation software, real-time translation software has gone from zero to one to now six languages and in a couple of years it's probably a hundred languages. The barriers of distance and the language are no longer separating us. When you look at computers, these human computers, in one sense, they became obsolete, but they didn't. Instead of doing computing, they started using computing and choosing what to do with it all around the world. And that is what we are going to be able to do. We all can start saying, what are the problems which we are looking at, which we want to solve? Because these problems exist, they're huge, they need to be worked on, and we can be the ones working on them. When we look at the scale of the problems that we're facing in the world, and we look at these potential changes, yes, if we don't know about them, if we don't understand exponential technologies, we could be surprised by them. And they are gonna change education, our governance, the, the nature of society. If we don't understand them, we could be building systems that were obsolete before they're done. But the good news is, is that we can understand them. And if we know their capabilities and are all working on them together, instead of being surprised and making obsolete systems, we can define what problems we want to make obsolete. So as they say, I am not excited by new technologies, I'm excited by old technologies. But it isn't just about the old technologies, I'm excited by what old technologies plus seven billion people working on them together can be. I'm excited by them. I hope you all are too. Thank you.